Hello scholars, welcome. Professor Hinkle here and today we are going to talk about plate tectonics and marine geology. So you might be thinking plate tectonics, marine geology, most of those words aren't about the oceans at all. Well, Oceanography is a multidisciplinary uh, approach to understanding our Earth's oceans and geology really helps set the stage because a lot of what we do know in the oceans come from the shape, the structure of the bottom of the oceans and that is dictated by plate tectonics. Plate tectonics is this unifying theory that brings together where there are mountains, where there are continents, different types of rocks, the rock cycle, the age of the earth, why we have uh, continents where they are, oceans where they are. So it really ties all of our different independent thoughts together. It weaves them so that we have a coherent idea for the structure of our earth, including the earth's oceans. So before we go any further in our discussion of oceanography, it's really important to get foundational, fundamental, and start to learn about the theory of plate tectonics, the structure of the oceans from a marine geological perspective. Let's go for it. So what we will do today is we will get into Alfred Wegener's idea of continental drift. We'll look at how paleomagnetic evidence supports plate movement. We'll explain mantle convection, the process that actually drives plate, plate tectonics. We'll look at different ways that plate tectonics interact with each other and the various uh, geological features that are associated with them. We will describe the differences between passive and active continental margins. We'll look at geological features such as seamounts, gyos, and hotspots. And then we'll get into some of these other marine geological features such as coral reefs, uh, hydrothermal vents, and volcanic islands. So much good stuff in our lecture today. I love it. Okay, let's get into it. So, the theory of plate tectonics, it states that the outside of our Earth is covered with large, rigid tectonic plates. Now, this may have been something you've already heard, this may be brand new to you, but within the field of science, within the realm of geology, this came about around the 1960s, and the whole idea that plates could move, well, it was really proposed in 1915. So these ideas that I'm sharing with you are less than 100 years old as far as being out there in the scientific community for others in a very social way to address and to test, to prove falsifiable. Basic tenet of science is falsifiability. And so we can see here in a projection of the Earth, tectonic boundaries that are running all the way around. And if we explode those boundaries out, so they pop, we can see that there are less than 15 giant plates. Now the Antarctica plate and the Antarctic plate will wrap around the bottom, same with the North American plate around the North Pole, but distributed throughout the entire Earth, including the Earth's oceans, are large tectonic plates made of oceanic and continental crust. If we remember back to origins and structures of the Earth, the crust is the uppermost layer. We've got the core mantle crust, and the upper mantle and the crust has what's called the lithosphere and asthenosphere. This is a brief review. The lithosphere can be oceanic or continental. And these, the lithosphere, now that we have that background, the lithosphere is broken into large tectonic plates that have what are known as tectonic boundaries. Okay, really cool. Let's go into the history books a little bit. So we have this uh, German meteorologist, 
uh, Alfred Wegener, he's a trained astronomer, geographer. He got his hands on some uh, evidence of fossils and started to think deeply about origins and structure and history of the earth. So Alfred Wegener was a jack of all trades. Here he is on a polar expedition, uh, smoking his pipe, trying to keep warm. So he was a pretty extraordinary individual, and he had this idea that once all the continents on our Earth were joined together in a supercontinent, and he called this supercontinent Pangaea, pan meaning all, Gaia meaning Earth, Pangaea. And he said that there was this movement of the continental of the continents through what he called continental drift now this was just an idea it was a good idea and he had lines of evidence to support this idea he fell short of an actual mechanism this came later in the history of plate tectonics but 1915 alfred wegener proposes he writes about his idea of continental drift and he goes like this he says well you know, I'm not the first person to notice that uh, the continents fit together like puzzle pieces, but it is a really um, remarkable uh, connection, correlation between opposing continents. So here we have the continent of Africa. Now this was from a large map that I have since cut out for our viewing pleasure. And then here we have the continent of South America. And to really show this, we can see how Africa and South America line up quite well. Their coastlines match almost identically. And if we go even further into the research here, what we find is that the continental shelf, if we remember marine provinces, we've got continental margins, deep ocean basins, and mid-ocean ridges. The continental margin is a continental shelf, a continental slope, and a continental rise. Well, the continental slope, the shelf break of these opposing continents lines up almost perfectly. It's too good. Maybe we need to take a step back with this so we can see. It's almost too good to be true. Okay, so there's line of evidence number one. Number two, fossils. This was what really piqued his interest. He started to do some research, Wegener that is, and learned that fossils like the Mesosaurus, like the Glossopteris, like the remains of Sinognathus, were found all over the entire world on all continents. But the fossils of these organisms, they wouldn't have been able to transport themselves from continent to continent. So the prevailing idea at this point was land bridges, that there was little pieces of land that these different species would hop, 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 hop from one to the other. Uh, ended up not being true. That was an idea that was falsified. Um, so he said there's fossils all over. Line of evidence number two distribution of fossils. Number three, matching geologic units on opposing continents. So this was early indications of the process of continental rifting, creating mountain ranges that then turn into ocean basins. Well, Africa and South America have geologically similar rock units and uh, Scandinavia, Northern Europe, and the United States, the East Coast, have geologically similar rock units. Well, according to Steno's principles of stratigraphy, we know that uh, rocks are deposited laterally continuous. We know that rocks of the same mineralogical content must have been deposited at the same time in the same place. And so to have the same rocks on opposite sides of the ocean that's very curious. So concept number three, supporting evidence number three, matching geologic units. 
And number four, the distribution of climatic belts. Two, I mean, there's a lot here. I love this image. It says a lot. It's got coal swamps, desert sand, salt flats, reefs, glaciated deserts, tropics. So all of those are happening. The big ones to really think about are glaciation. During Pangaea, Africa, South America, India, and Australia. Now, India and Australia aren't getting frozen over anytime soon. Australia is very hot. Um, but 250 million years ago, when they were, when all the continents were formed together and they were in a different location, and we had a global cooling period, which is natural, periods of global warming and global cooling are natural artifacts of our dynamic Earth, but also tropical forests. So this is in the Mesozoic long time ago. So dinosaurs were on the Earth, and during this period, it, we had the evolution of vascular plants that turned into these humongous tropical forests with such big vegetation, nothing like we've ever seen before here on Earth today. But the remains of these tropical swamps and forests turned into coal over the hundreds of millions of years. The geological processes of transformation uh, have thus created fossil fuels, which are found, again, distributed across South America, North America, Europe, and Asia. So evidence number four, climatic belts. So what does that give us? That gives us puzzle piece fit, fossils, matching geologic units, and climatic belts. Now these are great lines of evidence, but the missing piece was, okay, nobody believed Wegner. Other scientists said, yeah, 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 okay, great idea, but prove it. Can you prove it? And he couldn't. He had some ideas, but they proved wrong. Now, continental drift actually proved right. But the mechanism for continental drift was not there. That's why we don't have the theory of continental drift. We have the theory of plate tectonics. It's more um, comprehensive. And here's how we know. Let's keep going. So our Earth is amazing. It is so cool. It's got this layered structure core mantle crust from the differentiation uh, when it was all one big hot ball of material four and a half billion years ago. The denser, heavier elements sank to the middle and the lighter, less dense elements floated to the top. And there's a lot of heat transfer that goes on. In the cooling four and a half billion years ago, the core became a solid inner core, a liquid outer core, and it is that liquid of the outer core that produces Earth's magnetic field. Kind of like the center of the Earth has a big bar magnet where iron shavings go out one pole and into the other. It's a good thing this happens because the sun emits solar winds that if we didn't have plate tectonics and we didn't have... Uh, Earth's internal heat that is releasing, and we didn't have a magnetic field, those solar winds would strip our atmosphere, they would strip our water, and we would be left barren, kind of like our neighbor Mars. But we do have a magnetic field, and it is awesome. Thank you, outer core liquid. So let's talk about the magnetic field a little bit. A compass orients in the direction of Earth's magnetic field. It's one reason that it is a trusty, valuable instrument for navigation and for helping you survive should your phone or your GPS ever die and you find yourself in the wilderness. Now, let's talk about two things. First is going to be inclination. It is the dip of the needle that is always aligned towards Earth's magnetic north pole. So no matter where you are on Earth, let me simplify this, no matter where you are on Earth, your compass points towards the magnetic north pole. That is inclination. Now, declination is because we have a geographic north. Quick review. On a map, 
We have north, south, east, and west. Perfect. Now we've got our four cardinal directions. North is generally up unless the scale, the compass rose, tells us it's a different direction. But magnetic north does not align with where geographic north is. In fact, there is a declination, a difference between magnetic north and geographic north. So Earth has a magnetic field. There is an inclination of the magnetic field lines of where we are on the surface of Earth, and there is a declination, the difference between true north and magnetic north. I'm setting the stage. Stay with me. Rocks preserve the Earth's inclination and declination at the time of their deposition or at the time for igneous rocks of their crystallization. This is a really important concept for making the leap from continental drift to plate tectonics. Inclination, declination are preserved in the layers of rocks. Now we can study these rocks in what's known as paleomagnetism. Paleo is a good word for ancient or old and paleomagnetism studies the changes of Earth's magnetic field over long periods of time being hundreds of millions of years. Rocks from 500 million years ago to today. Now these red arrows are going to show magnetic dip. So they're not pointing the same direction. Now either one of two things is happening here. Either the magnetic North Pole is moving all over or the rocks are changing their position. Now it's actually a little bit of both. That was kind of a trick question. The magnetic pole does wander slightly and the continents change position slightly and we know the locations of both of those when we put them together in what looks like this. Okay, so go with me here. Figure on the left, I know you want to read this, but go with me here. Figure on the left. Rocks on North America follow this path that looks like so, the green line. And then rocks on this red arrow follow this opposite path. Opposite continents, when you look at the inclination and declination preserved in the rock record, look like they're pointing to two different places. But you've got these continents in different places, and they're pointing in different places. Let's see if I can do this. This one's on the fly. OK. But if you bring them together, they're pointing to the same place. OK, so I think that worked. Apart, the paleomagnetism recorded in the rock record shows that they are pointing to magnetic poles in different places. But if we back it up, we bring the continents together, we can see that rocks of varying ages will all point to a similar location in Earth's magnetic field. This is called paleogeography, the locations of continents in ancient times. Remember, paleo is ancient or old. And this is amazing. I've always wondered when I see these animations and recreations, here's the Earth over the last two million years, and you see continents separating and coming together, separating and coming together, separating, right, in these supercontinents. And the question, how do we know that? Well, the rocks tell us. This is a huge theme in geology. We understand Earth's history because the rocks have stories to tell us, and if we read them closely enough, we get to understand, we get to read those stories, and the stories that these rocks tell us in the magnetic signatures of their rocks are the one that says that helps to, remember, because we don't prove things in science, we don't prove absolute truths, we support ideas. 
and it supports the idea of plate tectonics, the idea of continental drift, that all the continents were once formed together in a supercontinent. In fact, there's been more than one. Um, okay, right, and so now we've got some more evidence to support continental drift, but again, what's the mechanism? Well, thank you to earthquakes for illuminating plate tectonic boundaries and what's happening at death through seismic waves. Through the process of seismic waves, we have an idea of Earth's internal structure. And from Earth's internal structure and the information that we get, we have developed these models for understanding plate tectonic mechanisms. And one of the prevailing ideas is the movement of heat in the mantle drives plate tectonics because even though the mantle is solid, it can flow very slowly like plastic over time. And that movement creates uh, areas of new crust and areas where crust is consumed. A little something like this. So processes associated with mantle convection are ridge push and slab pull. Okay. So, lots of hand waving coming up in this next little part. I love it. Ridge push. In the center of the ocean, the mid-ocean ridge, you have mantle material that is coming up and it is literally pushing its way up into the middle of the bottom of the ocean. As it does, it pushes the surrounding material outward. Now, let's go over to a continental margin. Here or here. This giant oceanic lithospheric plate subducts underneath which means that when it collides with another plate it goes underneath and it's kind of like hanging uh, if your blanket is too far near the edge of the bed or we might be able to use this we'll see right if it's a little bit no big deal oh but then the weight of the object pulled it off the table your blanket does that if it's too close to the edge of your bed and a tectonic plate does this when it's at a convergent boundary. More on that to come here soon. So plates are moving underneath our feet in fits and spurts. Every time there's an earthquake, pow, that is a plate movement. Thousands of earthquakes every single year all over the world, they're happening. About one major earthquake that we hear of that is a uh, very high magnitude on the Richter scale that causes lots of uh, property damage. We, at this point, right, so we're fast forwarding between the ideas and now we're where we're at now. At this point, we know that there are tectonic plates. We can observe them. We can observe the rate of plate movement. About average five centimeters per year, somewhere between one and 10. Our human fingernails grow about six centimeters per year. So Earth's plates are moving at about the rate that our fingernails are growing. Imperceptible, but still significant. And then you think about if your fingernail grew for a year, how long it would be? For 10 years, how long it would be? A hundred years? A million years? A hundred million years? Okay, so now I think we're starting to say, in the, in the concept of geologic time, which is big, vast, deep, yes, our continents could have moved from where they once were, supercontinent Pangaea, to where they are today. Skipped ahead a little bit on what paleogeography is, but is the locations of continents in Earth's past. 225 million years ago, we had a supercontinent, Pangaea. There's more behind that. Laurasia, Gondwanaland, Rodinia. There's, this is a whole concept. Please join me in historical geology if you would like to learn more. If you think this is awesome, we could talk about this. Totally cool, no problem. Then, continental rifting happened between South America and Africa, between North America and Europe, and the continents started to split apart. 
As they split, they continue to move, to move. Here's a fun one. India split, and it traveled across the Indian Ocean. Here we see it coming up, and then slammed into Asia, which is why the Himalayan mountains are an active, young, fold and thrust belt, continent, continent collision. They're actually growing up still. They're still getting older. They're still growing up. There's a lot happening there. Um, a lot of history from where India was to where it is now. So the movement of Earth's continents, continental drift through the process of plate tectonics is happening right now in real time. Okay, that's a lot of backgrounds. Very good. Let's go through some features of continental drift. There are, let me rephrase that. Let's go through features of plate tectonics. Continental drift was an idea from Alfred Wegener in 1915, leading to the development through many series and steps, which is out of the scope of this discussion, to the theory of plate tectonics in the 1960s, to what we know today about the structure of our Earth in relation to plate tectonics. So there's three boundaries, divergent, convergent, and transform. Every boundary between two tectonic plates is either divergent, te uh, convergent, or transform. The seams of the Earth's ocean, like a baseball, are one giant undersea mountain range, the longest topographic feature on Earth. It's about 65,000 kilometers long, has an elevated profile. This is where new Earth is made. This is where oceanic lithosphere, ridge push, comes up from the mantle and erupts in this volcanic underwater mountain chain creating divergent plate boundaries through the process of sea floor spreading, just like it sounds. <clears throat> Here we can see upward movement of mantle rock presses into oceanic lithosphere, pushing lithosphere outwards. And there are outcrops, which are exposures of rocks, as close by as Avila Beach, where we see these Nice little comfy pillow rocks. Maybe I'll lay my head down and take a nap in this lecture. Nope, too exciting. Can't do that. But these rocks that are erupted in the bottom of the ocean are called pillow lavas. They cackle and they burn and on fire in the bottom of the ocean. And it's really, really cool. And occasionally, pieces of oceanic crust are scraped up onto the surface of the earth giving us these beautiful exposures as close to home as Avila Beach into pillow lavas. Now you can imagine at a mid-ocean ridge where new crust is erupting, what we have is brand, and I said that, brand new oceanic lithosphere. So think of it like this. As this one comes up, it pushes my hand over. This hand is now older than this hand. Imagine this hand is still here. This one comes up and pushes it over. Younger comes up, younger. So basically what I'm getting at, and if I can highlight this on the board, is that a mid-ocean ridge? It is youngest in the middle. And oldest at the continental margins. So we're really good. Radiometric dating has allowed us to understand absolute ages of rocks. We can drill in the bottom of the ocean, and the Heason and Tharp map has helped us to understand that it's youngest at spreading centers and progressively older out towards continental margins. This is the age of seafloor. This is incredibly important for helping to support this idea of plate tectonics, right? Also, continents float on top of, ah, let me restate that. Continental lithosphere is less dense than oceanic lithosphere. And so when you have a collision of continental and oceanic lithosphere, 
the less dense floats and the more dense sinks, kind of like ice is less dense than water. So we have continents that are made of continental lithosphere that has been around. The oldest is about 4 billion years old, which is unfathomable to think about. A fathom, if we remember, is uh, actually a measurement of standardized to six feet, which Posidonius did for his original soundings, which had nothing to do with sound when he was first exploring the depths of the Mediterranean Ocean. Now we know the depths of the ocean is vast. Diverge. Let's bring it back. The oldest op open ocean lithospheric, uh, lithosphere is 180 million years old. Continents have been around for a long time. Oceans are continually recycling themselves. They actually have a life cycle called a Wilson cycle, named after John Tuzo Wilson, who identified and uh, characterized this cycle of the evolution of ocean basins, again, outside of the scope, but a lot of it is, this is a big topic. There's just so much good information to go over. Okay, so supporting evidence for plate tectonics in real time. We have the age of the ocean crust. We have the thickness of ocean sediments, thicker at continental margins, thinner at mid-ocean ridges, because the continental margins, the crust near the margins have been around longer. They've had more opportunity to have deposition on top of them in these deep ocean basins as they've been traveling along. Magnetic reversals are recorded in rocks and in the oceanic lithosphere. And it goes like this. North Pole, South Pole, everything's all good for a while. Hey, south to North. Everything's all good for a while. And then we have anomalies that are recorded in oceanic rocks and they're interpreted to be a reversal of earth's magnetic field now this is wild earth's magnetic field shifts for reasons that we haven't quite figured out yet but we can record this in or we can uh observe this in oceanic rocks and what do we see is that the rocks on either side of the mid-ocean ridge are parallel. There are stripes that are parallel in age and magnetic anomalies, which indicate the direction of Earth's magnetic fields. Wow. The Earth is so cool. It, mm, okay, I'm going to not get, go down that train right now. So we've got divergent, convergent, transform. Let's talk about convergent. Now, this is where two tectonic plates are moving towards each other. <clears throat> and there's two types of lithosphere, oceanic lithosphere, continental lithosphere, which means that we can have oceanic continental, oceanic oceanic, continental continental. Two types, three options. And what we get is in the case of oceanic oceanic or oceanic continental there is a subduction zone where one plate subducts underneath the other the result is mountains so this is an oceanic plate and this is an oceanic plate the older more dense plate subducts underneath the younger less dense oceanic plate partial or flux melting occurs at depth which creates a line of volcanoes. Something very similar happens when we get oceanic crust and, lit and continental crust. There's subduction of the oceanic because it's more dense, causing partial melting, which gives us a line of volcanoes. We see it here in Oregon and Washington with the Cascades. Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood, Mount Adams. They're all in a line. Products of continental oceanic convergence. Okay, don't want to get too hung up on this, but a nice introduction. Our third and final type is going to be continental continental collisions, where we have two continental plates, and there they both just keep pressing into each other, forming really big mountain ranges like the Himalayas. Okay. 
Moving on to transform, like our beloved giant fault that runs right through America, which is the boundary between the Pacific plate on the Pacific Ocean side and the North American plate on the North America side. Now, no crust is being created nor consumed here. There is also no vertical movement. It is horizontal movements of one plate sliding across another. Why does this happen? Uh, you could really think about, okay, there's new crust in some places being created, spreading centers, mid-ocean ridges. There's crust being consumed. This is very complex, and all this is happening on a spherical globe. It's very complex. So there's some places where there's no new crust being made and there's no subduction zone, and to account for that variability, plates will slide right next to each other. Here's the Juan de Fuca. It's getting consumed. The Cascades are right here. And then we've got some spreading centers starting to come in here in the Baja, California, splitting Baja from uh, the mainland of Mexico. And to account for some of these tectonic stresses, we get a right lateral transform fault moving directly through the continent. Here is an aerial view of what the San, uh, the San Andreas Fault looks like. It's a big scar in the ground, and it moves, sometimes a little bit, sometimes a lot of it. And we're waiting, if you've ever heard about like, oh, the next big one's coming sometime. Well, that's because plates move on average five centimeters per year, but sometimes it can be as much as 30 meters in one go. That is significant. And the amount of seismic uh, activity that would be released from a movement that big would level cities and uh, it, would, it would be bad. It would be bad. That's why sustainable development has natural hazards included in their design. Earthquakes, thank you earthquakes. Not for being such a hazard, but for being such an illuminator for helping us. Okay, so how do we know this? This is my favorite question. How Are you going to tell me how we know this? And I am right here. Earthquakes. Earthquakes are sudden bursts of energy that is released when there's movement along boundaries between breaks in the earth. And if we plot earthquake magnitude and intensity with depth, we can actually locate Earth's tectonic boundaries, and we can get a cross-sectional view um, when we think about the global distribution of large earthquakes. So earthquakes help us to visualize, and they support the idea that plate tectonics is a driving force shaping the surface of the Earth and has been around for a long time, uniformitarianism. Thank you, James Hutton. And <clears throat> the earth is covered by large tectonic plates that have moved according to the idea of continental drift. Okay, we just kind of got all those concepts in there. So let's talk about some marine geology here. The Hawaiian Islands are another great place for us to understand and prove support the idea, provide evidence, I should say, support the idea of plate tectonics. Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii, has the active volcano Kilauea. The biggest shield volcano in the world is right next to it, Mauna Loa, but it's no longer active. It's right next door. They form the same island. And then we've got right Oahu, Maui, uh, Kauai, and there's one more I'm missing. I'm sorry about my Hawaiian geography. The only active volcanic, the only active Hawaiian island that has a volcano is the Big Island because it is a mantle hotspot where mantle material comes up and it breaks through the crust in one location. The, forget that this is Africa. This is just now, this is the Pacific Plate. So, if the location of my clicker is the hotspot, it can form an island on top. The 
plate will move over it. This might not have been the best demonstration because it doesn't curl under it. But the point here is that the plate moves over, let's use my arm, and the mantle hotspot stays in the same location. This is pretty cool. If we think about the Hawaiian sea chain and the emperor sea chain, we can see that the ages are from youngest and progressively older all the ways they go up. Now there's this big notch here in uh, between the Emperor Seamount chain and the Hawaiian chain. And we look at that and we say, oh, the plate was moving this direction and then it started to move this direction. So we can actually record paleogeography, plate motion, plate movements in the rocks that are underneath the surface of the ocean, right? And those would be either uh, sea mounts if they erupted and never broke surface, or table mounts if they were once on top of the surface but then had been subsequently eroded flat. So very cool marine geology right here. Little did you know, Hawaii was more than just a tropical paradise. Well, maybe not tropical, but uh, island paradise. It is actually a hot spot, pun intended, for marine geology. <clears throat> Coral reefs. Corals are so cool. They support abundant biodiversity. They're a whole, it's like an alien world under there if you've ever gotten a chance to go scuba diving or watched a documentary that looks at coral reefs. And we will, don't worry if you haven't, it's coming your way soon. And they follow a sequence of events, stages of development that are associated with these marine geological features. So we get a volcanic island that comes up out of the uh, sea. It could be a hot spot. It could be uh, uh, ocean. It could be a oceanic, oceanic. Uh, subduction zone that's creating a volcanic island arc. So there's various ways here. Now this volcanic island starts to develop a coral reef around it because the conditions are right for coral development. This is called a fringing reef. Well, the volcano starts to subside and get eroded away, but the reef continues to grow and develop. Then a little bit of water starts to develop between the reef and the land. This is called a barrier reef now. Not when the reef is right on the side, but when there's ocean between the volcanic island and the reef. Eventually, the volcano will completely subside and then the reef will stick out on either side where it was before and then completely cap the volcanic island creating a lagoon inside and this is now called an atoll. So we can look at these features in the middle of the ocean and we can start to recreate some of the geologic history, the marine geology through very special features in the ocean. Okay, last big one that I want to touch on here is hydrothermal vents. Wow, these were discovered in 1977 by the submersible Alvin, cruising around, checking out mid-ocean ridges, and then all of a sudden, there's these vents of superheated water and material chemicals. These are like the lungs, uh, no, 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 the lungs? No the liver of the earth that purify the water, except it's kind of like a reverse purification because they keep the oceans full of various minerals and chemicals, sulfurs and sulfides and that kind of stuff um, uh, to help stabilize the pH and the chemistry of seawater. Really awesome. It's not the only awesome thing about these. They also host a whole suite of life that survives not on photosynthesis as the basis of the food web, but on chemosynthesis. So humans eat plants and animals. Animals eat plants. Everything eventually comes to primary producers to organisms that take energy from the sun and then produce their 
own energy from that. Consumers eat the energy produced by producers. Okay, life is all fine and dandy. But there's no sunlight down at the bottom of the ocean and it's really hot. So the basis of the food web are chemosynthetic bacteria. It is bacteria that actually reproduce on the chemicals that are being emitted, not like chemicals underneath your sink, but on the elements that are being flushed through these cracks in the bottom of the ocean, feeding the bacteria, and the bacteria are the basis of the food web that hosts a whole suite of life for these deep sea food chains, which opens up the big question. Is this where life originated? We talked about life originating in the oceans, but specifically, is it in these areas of hydrothermal vents? This would help explain how life survived the earth freezing over twice. What? Snowball earth. We'll get into that too, but that is another discussion for another day. So hydrothermal vents, really awesome features. Um, they were discovered, now we see them along mid-ocean ridges all over the world. Possible orange of life, already got into that. Please be sure to watch this video that is in your videos, not only this one, but the whole variety of all of them. There is so much great content that helps put these slides and these words into visualization that can help you truly comprehend the magnitude of some of these really big topics, which I know if you're feeling like, whew, there was a lot of them. There was, trust me, and you've been doing great. So to summarize, to conclude today's lecture, the theory of plate tectonics is the unifying idea that brings together geology and biology, the atmosphere, climate, everything. It really, really helps us to understand how these subsystems, how these pieces of the whole fit together. With this knowledge of plate tectonics, we have a better understanding of ocean basins, of the structure and the shape of the ocean, which allows us to go even further for understanding our world's oceans. And the oceans hold secrets in their depths that can help unlock the mysteries of Earth's evolution. There's still a lot to be learned. So much. Final frontier of Earth. I mean, space. Not to get too Star Trek on you, but um, space is definitely a final frontier. But for Earth, our Earth, one of the remaining big unknowns is the depths of the bottom of the ocean. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you loved today's content as much as I do. Geology is cool, and there's a lot more on this um, that we could go into. But this is a really, really good uh, fundamental understanding of marine geology so that we can now launch into some of the finer, deeper points of oceanography. Thank you so much and have a great day.